Okay, good morning, church. Good morning. <laughs> um, I have just a couple of things I want to touch base with you about. On the back of your bulletin are the updated announcements. We've got one more week with the unbaked bake sale. The cake, cardboard cake, is on the table in the cafe, and you can read about why you want to do that down here. Um, 
The other thing is, you all got a Connect card when you came in. We do take attendance, and that's okay. It's important for us to know who, who people are and where they live. The other thing is that sometimes, because we are a senior population, we fall, or maybe we get sick, or maybe we're hospitalized, and nobody thinks to let the church know. We're family. If I don't know where you are, I can't send a card. I can do my prayers, and they continue. But I spent some time yesterday with another friend driving around trying to locate somebody that we haven't seen for a while. Would you, on the back of your Connect card, write the letters ICE in case of emergency, and then give us somebody that will know where you are? If you're going on a cruise, we want to celebrate with you. <laughs> we want to come with you. <laughs> we, yeah, we want to go with you. But if you're, if you're how we can support you. I don't intend to be invasive about it. I'm not into gossiping about it. It doesn't go to me anyway. It goes to paperwork in the office. But that way, if somebody says, gosh, I haven't seen so-and-so for a couple of weeks. Does anybody know what happened to them? we've got a way to get, get some information that might be helpful. So could you do that for today? And those of you out in wherever land that goes, make sure somebody knows what you're doing and where you are. It's important in this day and age. Any questions? No, nope. no questions. Okay, will you stand please and join me in the call to worship? I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He rules the world in righteousness. And judges the people with equity. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed. For those who know your name, trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. And now it's joyful, joyful, we adore thee.
morning again, church, and those online. Would you bow your heads for a prayer, please? Most gracious and loving Father God, we are a hurting world. Daily we turn on the news and we see political battles and unrest around the world. And, and because of a human desire for power and control, there has become a reality of war resulting in massive death and destruction. Lord, we pray for peace. We hear of first responders in our own country putting their lives at risk to protect and serve only to have their life become a sacrifice in the line of duty. And there are others who abuse that position of authority and who threaten to take the life of another because of bigotry, rage, and prejudice. Lord, we, we pray for justice. We watch around us as, as COVID and other epidemics rise around us and witness all too often the loss of someone near to us. Hospitals and caregivers are struggling. The nurses and doctors and other caregivers are exhausted. Lord, we pray for healing and strength that only you can provide. And, and as we witness these things and see divisions occurring in our own denomination and others around the country, many of us struggle with our own belief and a different kind of war rages within our own lives. Oh, and a war that often feels like Satan is winning. Lord, we pray for faith and a deeper relationship with you. Forgive us, Lord, and remind us that you came to live among us and made the ultimate sacrifice to show your love for us and to become the final and complete sacrifice for our sins. Lord, we pray for understanding and grace. Create in us a willingness to sacrifice as a sign of our love for you in return and to rise up and follow you, leaving behind those things that are insignificant and giving to you whatever re you require of our time, our earthly possessions, and our energies to further your work in our church, in our community, and around the world. Lord, we pray for your presence within us. It is with that holy presence that we now lift our voices together and pray the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. What's the next song? Song is oh, here's a song they may not know, but you'll get it. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to remember how it goes. So be patient <laughs> and gracious. <laughs>
All right, you did great. Thank you. <laughs> Jeanette introduced that song to us this week. And, uh, of course, we didn't get a chance to practice as a quartet beforehand because of the video. But thank you for being so gracious. Isn't that a good song? I really do like that. It fits very well. This morning in the children's chat, I shared with them this picture, which is a picture <laughs> from about 30 years ago in... Uh, Nicholasville, Kentucky. This is a, one of the dining cars from my old Kentucky dinner train. And I'm standing right here in the middle next to the fellow who owns the railroad company, Rick Corman, R.J. Corman Railroads. And sitting in front of me is my beautiful bride. You can't see that, but if you're bored after church, come on up and look. And the point of that illustration was this. I asked the kids if they'd ever seen a train or been on a train. I was surprised to find out several have, but I'm sure if I would have asked, it would have been Mickey Mouse's train at Disney World. But, um, so I asked them, so there's basically a difference between a car, on a car you can choose to turn right or turn left, but a train runs on a set of what? Tracks. And so our life choices, some of them tend to put us on the right track or the wrong track. And as far as Christianity is concerned, there's two tracks. It's not so much a stairway to heaven, but consider it there's a, there's a path a track that goes to heaven. Uh, and that is one train. And then there's another direction you can go. And it really is based on uh, whether or not who is the conductor of your life, who is the Lord of your life, uh, which set of tracks you're actually, actually running on. Um, on the one set of tracks, uh, you live for yourself. I mean, it seems easy because you decide what's right and wrong. You decide what's good and bad, you know, evil or not so evil. So it's all relative based on the human experience. So it is a train track that the Bible describes as the wide road, the wide way. How does the Bible describe the other train track going towards heaven? The narrow way, all right? So uh, while you're in a train station, there's two trains. One looks like it's going in the direction you really want to go. It's going to be fun, it's going to be exciting, and nobody's going to tell you what to do and what not to do. How, how many of you would sign up for that train? You know where this is going, so you're not going to sign up. I know. Yeah, 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 yeah. But most of us would, and most of us do. We do, because we're human. Okay, we, we are born into the human condition. Uh, if it's to me, it's up to me. You know, if I can get away with it, I'll get away with it. Uh, but then we are asked by the conductor of life to choose the other train, which often means we choose against our own self-interest. Uh, the definition, a good working definition of love is to do what is right for the other person, even if it costs you. Would you agree that's a good working definition of love? There's all kinds of mamby-pamby definitions. As long as I like you, that's love. No, it's not. You can like somebody and be very unloving towards them. So love is actively working for the good of another, no matter who that other is. So I shared with them that that is basically what's behind our conversation today. It's, it's a conversation about two directions. And one seems easy and seems natural and seems right to us. And the other way, the way that actually goes up, uh, is the harder way. It's the way of the Christ. Uh, so they seem to get that, but you know, they always want to make the pastor feel good, so you don't know. For all I know, they were all going to get a cookie and go to class, so who knows. So uh, we are continuing this series, a four, short series in August, four conversations that Jesus had with people 2,000 years ago, and he's had with people every year since then, and he wants to have with each of us. And it's a conversation primarily with people who are not currently following Jesus. People who are in that train station and haven't really made a decision uh, to board either train. They're sort of just milling around, waiting uh, for something to prompt them to board one of those trains. Uh, in this series, um, the first week, we looked at a tax collector, a publican. What was his name? Matthew. Matthew. And he was busy with his own life. He had his own circle of friends. Uh, you know, he knew that most people didn't like him. The Jews, the Romans probably liked him a little more than the Jews uh, because they helped pay their salaries. Uh, but by and large, he knew people didn't like him, and that was all right because he made money. He had signed up for it. He was just doing the job he was being paid for. And he did have friends. We got that from that story. Uh, the amazing thing is, though, somebody who was conducting a different train came up to him and said, Matthew, follow me. And what did he do? 
he got on the train. Isn't that amazing? I mean, uh, follow me, and he follows him. We don't know how many conversations took place before, but in that moment, he responded to the offer to get on the right train. And then last weekend, we talked about the reality uh, about being loved and forgiven. And a lot of people want to think that that's the default. We're loved and forgiven. Uh, The truth is we're all loved. There's nothing you could do or not do, nothing you could say or not say that could God cause God to love you more or less than God does now. You are loved unconditionally by God. But there is something that needs to take place before you can be forgiven. What is that? Yeah, confession is the first part of repentance. It's that idea of reorienting your life. If you boarded the wrong train in a situation or a relationship, uh, then like Matthew, you've got to say, I'm on the wrong train. And you've got to respond to the offer of the Christ to not just be loved by God, to be forgiven by God's Son, Jesus Christ. And if you remember, the two characters in that story, do you remember who they were? The Pharisee and the... And one of them ends up closer to Jesus at the end of that story. One ends up even farther away. Which one ends up closer? The prostitute. Why? Because she was willing to recognize she was on the wrong track. She was willing to... uh, Say, you know, what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, what I'm doing is not honoring to who God created me to be, uh, and it's not honoring to the God who loves me. So she made significant changes in her life. Remember, she poured out that perfume on Jesus' feet, right? And that was, you know, basically abandoning her trade. Uh, She had to find something else to do. That's really what it means to follow Jesus. It's uh, what I've done, I'm recognizing, isn't what needs to be done, so I'm going to do something new. I'm going to become a, a new creation. Today's conversation is, again, uh, along these lines of salvation. Uh, not just for people far beyond the reach of God, but for those of us who are next to God and called to reach out to them. So it is a tricky conversation. When somebody sneezes, what do you automatically say? God bless you. Is that the only time you ever bless somebody in the name of Christ? Is, I remember um, I was in seminary and I came home and uh, my sister Mary sneezed and I just automatically said, what? And she said, is that official? <laughs> I looked at her and I thought for a moment, I said, I guess it is. <laughs> I mean, if I can bless communion, certainly I can bless your sneeze, right? So here's the deal. If you understand what you're seeing on that screen... This person has been quiet, hasn't said anything, and then suddenly they sneeze. And everybody, what's it say on the top left-hand side? We thought you were mute. Do your family and friends think that you're mute? Do they know that you follow Christ? Do they experience the truth that those who follow Christ are called to call others to follow Christ? So this is a little tricky conversation. Surveys tell us that less than 50% of those who identify as Christians have ever shared their faith with another person even one time. 50%. Now, listen, my heart is this, that we make this church a church that shares our faith. Not just hoping people catch it, but making sure we bless them directly, specifically, and frequently in the name of the God who is calling them to live closer to him. We don't want to put Jesus on mute. And so many Christians do. They really think Christianity is about being nice, being nice to people. Now, if you're not nice to people, you've got to ask yourself why. But being nice is just fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, self-control. But the fruit of the Holy Spirit living inside you, so salvation is the core issue. And so you can teach children to be nice, and they still go to hell. Did you know that? The first service knew that. (laughs) Uh, Jesus talks to our world through us. So if you're not talking to the world about Jesus, you really are putting Jesus on mute. Uh, Let's step into this story where this becomes obvious what what is taking place. Uh, So uh, you've got Jesus going into Peter's home. And his mother-in-law, what's that tell you about Peter? He's married. So for those of you who were raised with the idea that disciples never got married or had kids, uh, the Bible, plain reading of the Bible says that's not true. 
you know, not only did Mary have Jesus, he had brothers and sisters. And the words don't make it into cousins. It really is brother and sis- brothers and sisters. All right? So when Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. It was probably COVID. It's about been around forever, right? Right? So, uh, so he reaches out and touches her hand, and what happens? The fever leaves. And she gets up and began to serve him. Now, don't lose those words that are connected through color. So he reaches out and touches her. And something happens. She gets better. And when she gets better, she doesn't go to her, back to her old lifestyle. She doesn't continue to do what she was doing. She is all in for Jesus. I was sick, and I received the touch. And now I am going to serve the one who touched me. Anybody a Bill Gaither, Bill and Gloria Gaither fan? Do you know this song? He touched me, oh, he touched me, and oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know he touched me and made me whole. For too many of us that that have experienced the touch, that have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, we, look, we think it ends right there. Well, kids, salvation is the front porch of the experience of God and Jesus Christ. And if you sit out on the front porch, <laughs> you've so missed it. God wants you to come on in and allow the Holy Spirit to rearrange the furniture in your house. In other words, change, challenge and change your thoughts, challenge and change your feelings, challenge and change your actions. In other words, your life. That's what's happening here. Jesus touched Peter's mother-in-law. I'm fortunate I've got a mother-in-law. Some of you have mother-outlaws, but that's a different story. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he did what? He drove out the spirits. He didn't bring out the spirits. He drove out the spirits and healed all the sick. You know, this seems like a pretty typical response of Jesus to human need. Uh, We expect Jesus to do this. He's the one who said... Come unto me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, then I will give you what? Now, that's the Jesus we know and love. Come to me, all who are weary. We're all over that. But it doesn't end there. He didn't even take a breath. He continued the thought. Read it with me. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. Okay. So what is this he's talking? What is a yoke? It's that wooden cross piece going across those uh, two oxen in this case. Uh, It yokes together the strength of both. That's what Christianity is. We are yoked together with the Christ. Who's the senior partner in that arrangement? Christ, Jesus, yeah. So it's his strength. It's his thoughts. It's his lifestyle that we begin to conform to. Two, we don't try to pull Jesus in our personal bent. We don't try to change salvation to fit what I think it should be. I conform my life to the yoke of Christ. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. We want rest. We want relief. In other words, we want salvation. But we really are not sure about being yoked to anybody. That means that I'm no longer God of my own life. That means that uh, if I just more than saying a few words, uh, maybe joining a church, throwing a buck in the plate every now and then, maybe leading or starting a small group, serving on a committee or a mission or a ministry, that, you know, that should be enough. That's not what this says. You are to be yoked with Christ. Uh, so what is it exactly? I mean, We're called to pull together in the work of Christ. What is the work of Christ? Why did Jesus come? To seek and save who? The lost. So if you are yoked to Christ, what's your personal mission? To seek and to save the lost. And if your life, your spiritual life is still all about you, and I know it's uncomfortable, believe me, I know it's uncomfortable, to share faith, to share Christ with others, you got to push through that because we are called to not just be weary in the world. We are called to be Christ in the world. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. So the yoke we carry 
is the cross of Christ. How many of you have heard the phrase, take up your cross how often? Daily. This isn't something we do occasionally. We don't you know, share Jesus on mission or a three-day you know, share Jesus event. Uh, it's called to be part of our daily life. So the yoke that we're uh, uh, tied to Christ with pulls this gift of God called salvation. Uh, again, Jesus has done and is doing all the heavy lifting, but we are called as a response to the touch of Christ to join him in his work. That's exactly what happens in Peter's home when Jesus touches Peter's mother-in-law and she gives up and serves him. If you have been touched by Christ, you are called to rise up from the old lifestyle. You're called to not just get off the wrong train and get on the right train. You're called to call out to everybody as the train goes by. Do you know Jesus? Can I introduce you to the one who changed my... Can I introduce you to the hope that I have that transcends my illness, my disease, my discomfort to the one who is saving me and wants to save you. You go, well, that's not the deal, Jerry. That's not the Christianity I was baptized into. Well, then help me find your version of Christianity in these words, okay? Uh, so let's step back into that moment when Peter's mother-in-law and many others were healed with just a word, just a touch from Jesus. That, that seriously impressed a few people who were very religious. It goes on, the story. Then a teacher. I grew up calling him a scribe because that's the way it was in the New Revised Standard. Then a teacher of the law came to Jesus and said, what? Teacher, I will follow you. Isn't that great? Doesn't that count as a win for the kingdom, right? I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said something that makes you go, huh? Say what? Must be a typo in my Bible. Can I see your Bible, Lisa? You know, he says, he says foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. You'd expect him to say, hey, come on, follow me. You know, I mean, Matthew got up. Jesus said, you're in. The other disciples said, are you kidding? It's going to ruin our reputation. Did you realize he's a tax collector? He says to this guy, a teacher of the law, a scribe, somebody who's serious about knowing what God expects from us. And he says to him, this really strange thing we'll unpack in just a few minutes. And just to make sure you don't miss the point, Matthew, in his gospel, throws another one right next to it. Another disciple. Somebody else who's all in for God, supposedly. You know, I believe there's a God. I want to please that God. I want to know what God wants me to do, and I'll do it. Another disciple says to him, Lord, first let me do what? Go and bury my dad. Doesn't that seem like a reasonable request? Yeah, yeah. But Jesus said what? Follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. And you go, really? Can I see a, a contemporary English Bible, please? <laughs> Surely they've cleaned that up for me because I don't want to deal with that mess, right? We're going to deal with it this morning in just a few minutes. Uh, the response isn't what we'd expect from Jesus. Two religious people, people that sound like they're just exactly the kind of guys that Jesus is looking to call. You're the kind of guys you'd say, hey, to the rest of the disciples, hey, guys, take a look at these two. That's what I'm talking about. One of them is going to become the MVP. Peter, you're going to have to step aside because one of these guys... They're really going to make the team and make it better. Um, here's what I want you to hear. Jesus is not selling salvation. And yet so much of the church has made Jesus into little more than a salvation salesman. A little lower than a used car salesman. Any trick will do as long as you get them in the pew. Anybody is welcome who can fog a mirror, and there's no expectation other than you come once in a while. Uh, but with a real gospel, the truth is Jesus is saying right here, there are no hidden costs. There is no fine print. Here's all Jesus requires of any of us when we choose to follow him. He says, give me the keys to your life. No fine print. Give me the keys. How many of you have ever handed keys to a teenager? How did that make you feel? A little uneasy? Did you check your insurance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're like, really? Really? Uh, if you've not experienced that moment with Jesus, then you might consider what that means. You see, Jesus is a package deal. He is Savior. 
but he wants to be and requires that he become your Lord, handing the keys to your life. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord. Does anybody remember these old gospel songs? I'll do what you ask me to do. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the full gospel of Jesus Christ that has been watered down and turned into pablum that basically says you don't have to change at all. You just join us and we're happy you're here. But there are no requirements to following Jesus. And then you're confronted with this story. What do you do with this story if that is your theology? See, Jesus really is not a salvation salesman. Uh, but so many of us have turned him into just that. It, it's like the, the preacher who is walking by and there's a little boy on the front porch of a house and he was jumping up and down trying to press the doorbell, but he just wasn't tall enough. So the preacher was a nice guy. So he went over there and grabbed this little boy, held him up so he could do what? Push the button. And then he sets him down and he looks at the preacher, looks at the little boy and says, what do we do now? And the little boy says, run! <laughs> Too much of the church is just like that. We tell people there's this button called salvation and as long as they push it, they can run away from discipleship. You see, you're saved because you pushed the button. You said the words. And you have no more responsibility towards this one called Jesus. That's not what we do here at Roseland Church. We, we, we won't ask you to push a button, I believe, and then run away from teaching you how to be a follower of Jesus. That's not authentic Christianity. If you're here or online this morning and you're not yet a Christian, I want you to follow Jesus with every fiber of my being. But I don't want you to become inoculated against real Christianity by the form of Christianity that was disabled and is destroying the church of Jesus Christ. It's not just a matter of making a statement. It's a matter of getting off the wrong train and getting on the right train. So we have a goal at this church to reach 500 folks in the next five years and get them into a saving relationship of Jesus Christ. If you're part of another fellowship, that's great. Stay involved in that fellowship. But if you do not know Jesus Christ, come here. And not only will we help you reach the button called salvation, we will make sure you know why you pushed it and what happens next. Read 2 Corinthians 5.17 with me, would you? Those who become Christians become new persons. Too much Christianity says you don't have to change. Too much Christianity says you add Jesus to the old you. And it's good because you got Jesus in your holster. All right? That's not what the gospel says. They are not what? The same anymore for the old life is gone and a new life has begun. Does it mean the old life doesn't poke up its ugly head once in a while? Of course it doesn't. You are still you. But you now have the Christ, the Holy Spirit living inside you to challenge and change what you have always held to be true. So if you are not experiencing a change in any of your thoughts, in any of your emotions, in any of your actions, if you are basically the you before you came to know Jesus, I question whether or not you really came to know Jesus or the idea about Jesus. Because Jesus, when he moves in, he rearranges the furniture in your house. You go, well, I don't want that. Well, then <laughs> you want a Savior, but you don't want a Lord. If he's your Lord, he decides what the color of the couch is and where it's going to be. And you go, well, nobody's ever talked to me like this before, and I am so, so sorry. We have a goal to reach 500 people in the next five years, and I think that's a low ball because we're going to present the gospel for what it really is. It's not a free ticket. What it is, is a great ride in becoming the best possible version of you. You matter to God. And you matter to us. The journey from being a self-centered, broken person to being a Christ-centered servant. The journey that happened in a few moments with Peter's mother-in-law, who was healed, who was touched, and became a servant of Christ. That is the journey that we're involved in. And it makes a difference now in this life and forever in the next life. Hey, have you seen that movie, Sister Act? Do you remember Sister Act? 
Whoopi Goldberg, that's back when I understood Whoopi, okay? <laughs> uh, uh, she comes to a dying downtown church and reminds them that they're about the business of reaching the lost for Christ. And it was painful. But with because it was Hollywood, within a few short minutes, it becomes something beautiful. She helps them tear down the fences both outside the church and inside their hearts. Let's watch this clip together. I love that film. I haven't seen it in its entirety recently, but I'm going to now. I hope I've piqued your curiosity, too. Um, uh, that movie, and especially that scene where the church is packed again, where it had been empty before, where fear uh, had replaced trust in the nature and the work of Christ, uh, that is so powerful to me. That is who we are called to be. I grew up in a very nice church. Really, Bethel Methodist was amazing. Uh, it was filled with really nice people, and everybody knew everybody. You know, but if you did something wrong, you, by the time you got home, you already had three spankings because that was just the world we lived in, right? Uh, they gave me cookies and Kool-Aid and even a Bible because I became a third grader. Isn't that cool? You know, but as much as that was a warm, fuzzy, nice experience, I can't remember a single time I was actually asked to follow Christ. Now, last weekend as part of the children's chat, and actually we did it for the congregations as well, as we ask you to recommit or to commit your life for the first time to following Christ. You see, that is job number one. And you can be the nicest country club on the planet to children of all ages. And if you're not offering Christ, you're not a church of Jesus Christ. And yeah, I said it. And it is true. You see, Christianity is not a philosophy. It's a person. Jesus. Christianity is not a set of rules. It's a relationship with God through who? Jesus. Uh, when my parents divorced, my cookies and Kool-Aid uh, faith, it literally crumbled. At an altar call, I felt my, myself wrapped in the arms of God. And God said to me, not with an audible voice, but a voice that's much deeper and more profound, the life-changing reality has carried with me to this moment when I watch things like that, I remember. I remember like we remember Christ in communion. It's present. The reality that was true then is true again now. God loves me. And God loves you. 
God said to me then and says to me now, and every moment in between, even when I was walking on roads, that I, I'm so sorry, I drug the Holy Spirit down. But he never once let me go. I never walked alone again. This is Christianity. When Adam and Eve fired God in the Garden of Eden, they began a trend that continues to this very day, an open rebellion against God's rule. We want a Savior. We don't want a Lord. We want to be masters of our own fate. All of us have this basic, innate part of our nature to be selfish, to be self-centered. It's all about me. And that... It's called sin, and sin pushes God away, not once in a while, but every single time. So if you're feeling isolated, if you're feeling alone, if you're feeling that God no longer is wrapping his arms around you, you're letting your sin get between you and your God, and it's all here because we are assured that there is no power on heaven or earth No principality can separate us from the love of God found in Jesus Christ. But you can live your life as if. When Jesus comes into your life, he plants a seed that grows into every area of your life. If all you have is an hour on Sunday morning, you have yet to experience Christianity. In authentic following of Jesus Christ, we go from doing what's best for me and mine to doing what's best for others and the kingdom of God that is growing in me and hopefully in them and that we pray about every time we pray the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come. Thy what? Will be done. So if your will is holding away the God's will in your life and their life, isn't it time to stop being a hypocrite every time you pray about that? When Jesus comes into your life, he wants to take over your life. And that's hard. You know, I'm a pastor. I know that's hard to believe, but it's true. You know, I, I've been ordained. I mean, you know, I've served at Kentucky Conference, uh, Florida Conference, Indiana Conference. I've served in all kinds of capacities, but I'm a pastor by calling. Literally, I've tried to walk away from this call many times, but God has never let me. You know, I remember in Jacksonville, I'd come to a point at the end of my rope. My mom was dying, and I couldn't. I thought I had a transfer to the Indiana Conference, and Bishop Woody White said, You're in. And then I got a call from a DS in the Fort Wayne area says, you're out. (laughs) We're having to send six elders to Florida. We got no place to put you. And I said, can't you send seven? (laughs) I tell you, you don't get over being selfish. I'm just saying, okay? Um, And so I uh, had begun to look at employment outside of the church. Lisa and I interviewed with uh, uh, one of the largest Presbyterian church in in Cincinnati. I don't remember the name of it, university something. And... uh, they came to, it sounded good, phone interviews were great. They met us in Waycross, Georgia. Uh, I, we'd come up, they came down, and it was a great interview. They loved us. They were like, oh, you're in, and I'm going. But the tone of the interview, I am conservative in my theology. Most of you know that by now. But they were uber conservative. They had litmus tests. And, and it, it felt like, on the way home, as we were talking about it, it was a great job, you know, bigger church than First Methodist Jacksonville. It was, uh, it was, more money, and all the other mores that people strive for. And, and it just felt wrong. The, way they'd, the questions they'd ask and the way they'd ask them, basically, are you a good old boy and can you lead our good old boy club? And, I, and you know, I'm not saying anything against that church. I know we're online. And I don't know where you're at today, but 20, 20 years ago, that's where that interview was. And so um, here's what happened. We decided not to do that, and still the door was closed for me to get back up to Indiana. So I put in an application to Kraft Food Company. I just happened to see this advertisement for a manager at a Kraft Food plant in northern Indiana, and that was going to be close enough. I'd move my mom in with us. We'd take care of her her last few days. And uh, so, (laughs) and then somebody died in the middle of the state. I was asked to go down and do this funeral for whoever from First Jacks. So I'm driving down there, do the funeral. It's great. A couple people gave their heart during the service, and and uh, on the way back, I'm thirsty, so I stop at a gas station to get a Coca-Cola. I hate Pepsi, by the way, and that's all they had. So I look out the window, and there's a Kmart. Do you remember when Kmart was still in business? <laughs> and so I went over there, and right next to the checkout stand, there's this thing 
a cooler with Cokes in it. I grab a Coke and I'm waiting. I need to get back for a council meeting or a trustee meeting, something back in Jacksonville. And so I'm, I'm uh, impatient. And there's this little black boy, a little African-American boy in front of me. And he's got a wiffle ball and bat. And he's so excited, he's telling about how he's going to play with his brothers and sisters and all this stuff. And he gets up to pay for it. It's his turn at the register, and he doesn't have enough money. And I go, oh, no, are you kidding me? He said, I'll be right back. I go, really? And he runs off and talks to his mom. And he comes back, and you can tell she didn't have the money. <laughs> he is so broken. And, you know, I'd love to say I was being altruistic and all Christ-like. I said, I'll pay for it. Lady, I'll just pay for the whole thing. So I pulled out a $20 bill or a $10 bill and paid for it. And he looked up at me and he says, Mr., are you a pastor? Where'd that come from? I was being anything but pastoral in that moment. And without thinking, I said, yes, I am. I don't like to say there was a blinding flash and God's presence was obvious to me, but I was still mad. So I got in my car and I'm halfway to Jacksonville when it dawned on me. That God sent a little black boy to remind me who I am. It's not the only time. I've tried time and time again to lay down this mantle. Especially in a world and a church that's divided and I am not a leader of division. It hurts me at a very deep level. I am all about Jesus. And I'm all about leading people to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. But I don't know, not only do not care about playing church, it hurts me at a very deep level. The hypocrisy in a church that doesn't give a damn that people are going to hell in a handbasket. In fact, we're going to give them an upgrade on the basket so they feel better about going to hell. That hurts me at such a deep level. Level. The question is this. Are you all in? You know, is Jesus your Lord as well as your Savior? Or is, is it Jesus plus my version of church? You know, I'm not nearly as big as I used to be, but I'm still a pretty big guy. I sweat. It's what I do. It's, you go with your strengths, right? Some of you are there with me. So, you know, if the sanctuary is hot or cold, some people won't come back. I don't care. I'll freeze or burn for Jesus as long as it's somebody else to hear the message of salvation. Are you all in or are you saying that this is all about me? It's all about my prep. There's music that I despise and yet they make me sing it and I'm the pastor. I don't pick the music. I'm part of a team. I hate 7-Eleven songs. You know what a 7-Eleven song is? Seven words sung 11 times. It's like a Gregorian chant. I failed that in seminary, by the way. It doesn't move me. I like things that engage my brain and my heart, not try to put my brain asleep by working my heart. You know, Lisa and I would love a new car. But if my tithe and our financial gifts beyond the tithe can reach someone for Christ, then we're all in on the kingdom of God. So I, I do lose my patience with people who quibble about the tithe. The tithe is the Old Testament. Do you know how much of your income belongs to God in the New Testament? All of it. So if I ever seem impatient to you, remind me, you're a pastor. You promised to do that. And we'll continue to love Jesus together. That, that scribe came to Jesus and he was all juiced up. He says, I'll follow you wherever you go. But Jesus looked into his eyes and into his heart just as he does to each of us. And he says, really? Foxes have dens. Birds have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He's saying to him then and to us now, it's not about you and it's not about your kind. If you're going to follow Jesus, it's about the ones who aren't following yet. And then it gets even more weird. From there, you've got the one who, who's a, a disciple. He's all in for loving God, pleasing God, living for God. And he says, Lord, let me first do what? Bury my father. Context is everything. You know, this man knew and Jesus knew uh, that the, the religious requirement was if his father was dying, he couldn't be standing there talking to Jesus. 
He was required to be at his father's side. He was required to be at his father's side while he died. He was required to be at his father's side during the period of mourning afterwards. He wasn't at his father's side. Where was he? He was with Jesus. So what this man is really saying is, you know, Jesus, I love you. I love your thing. I want to join you in your thing. But I'm pretty sure dad won't approve. So I'll follow you once dad is dead. Now, people do this all the time. Uh, if you wait until you can afford to have children, when will you have children? Never. Never. Exactly. Uh, there's always a reason not to do something, including giving your life to Christ. We want him to be our Savior, but we're not sure about letting him be our Lord and actually change who we are and what we do and where we spend our time, talent and treasure. Uh, one of the most famous but first prayers, in other words, I'll follow, but first I want to. One of the most famous but first prayers is from a saint of the church, Augustine. Uh, he heard a guy, uh, Ambrose, preach, and it convicted him very deeply, and he wanted to follow Jesus. But the problem was, Augustine was a playboy. So he prayed this most famous prayer. It's in his the works, okay? He says, Lord, make me chaste but not yet. He still had a few good leads, a few girls to chase before he gave up that playboy lifestyle for Jesus. You know what Jesus said to him then? And to us who pray yes but prayers? I'll follow you, but I want to time it just right. I want to have sown all the wild oats in my life. I want to have gotten all the stuff I want before I get serious about building your kingdom in me and around me. He said to him then and to us now, no deal. There are no yes but conversions. Augustine did come around and made Jesus number one in his life, and it changed the church to this very day. I fear cheap grace. And I live in a time when cheap grace is being offered as genuine gospel. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said in the context of World War II, as thousands of good German Lutheran pastors who would not buy into the cultural version of Christianity, they were sent to prison and executed. And the thousands of other German Lutheran pastors who went along with it. One of the most heinous pictures I can't get out of my mind is the picture of a German Lutheran pastor in his full regalia, holding up and waving the swastika flag freaks me out. I had a flashback at Pasadena Community Church. Cliff Melvin and I were serving together, and the people who were supposed to bring in the standard, I don't know, 4th of July or whatever it was, uh, the person didn't show up. So Cliff went out there in his full robes, you know, and he grabbed the flag and carried it in. And I just was on the, the, the dais, and it was a dais, the platform up there is as big as this church. And I was just, I had a PTSD moment. I I was like trying to get myself together to get up and preach. The cross of Jesus Christ is above the flag of every land. The cross of Jesus Christ is above the demography of every single people group. We are called to offer salvation to the people that are like us and the people who don't like us. But cheap grace. What Dietrich Bonhoeffer pushed against then now, and I am pushing against in my own culture and in my own church. Cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. It's not coming from heaven, so it doesn't have the power of salvation. It's the preaching of forgiveness without what? No, without repentance. Uh, it, well, you know, it's okay. Whatever, just bring it in. Bring it in. Okay, it's... it's Baptism without church discipline. It's communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without what? I want the Savior. I want to feel good about my sin. But I don't want to have my sin challenged. And I certainly don't want to have my opinion, my thoughts, my feelings, and my action changed. I don't want discipleship. And that's what makes me so afraid today for the church of Jesus Christ. We are pandering to a culture that is clearly against the standard found in God's word. You know how this works. How many of you have ever played Monopoly? Have you? 
My mom took it away because we get in a fist fight every time. (laughs) I know you were more holy than we were, but still, we're all going to make it, okay? (laughs) So a get-out-of-jail-free card is like this. You pray a prayer, and you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. But then you take your little card and you put it in your back pocket, and you don't think about it again. You live your life the way you want to live. You think what you want to think. You uh, feel what you want to feel. You believe and act in ways that you think is right. And then one day, like all of us, you die, and you go to the pearly gates and you talk to St. Peter, and St. Peter is looking at you, scratching his head, and you hand him this card. I prayed the prayer. I got my get-out-of-jail-free card right here. St. Peter looks at it and says, Really? You're one of us? I would have never known. (laughs) It doesn't work this way. But a lot of people act as if it does. Turn that card over. Here's the truth. Read it with me. Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So what does it mean to confess with your mouth? Is it just a matter of saying some words in whatever language or is it a confession, agreeing with God that Jesus is what? that he has the right to take the keys of my life and to challenge and change the way I think and feel, no matter if the way I think and feel agrees with everybody else around me, if it is in disagreements with the plumb line of God's will and God's word. And you can be passionately wrong. Confess with your mouth. Agree with God, not just with words, but with a lifestyle that proclaims Jesus truly is Lord. Lord. And you will be raised in that final day the same way Christ was. Your heart truly is, it says at the bottom of that that card, your heart truly is the character of Christ reflected in your life. Salvation is, in fact, a show and tell. And I know this upsets some of you online and maybe even here, but Jesus is saying to the scribe and to the disciple in this story, as well as to each of us today, you're either all in you're not in at all. You cannot have Jesus as Savior without Jesus as Lord. And you can argue that until the cows come home, but argue it through the lens of Scripture. And I think you'll come to a conclusion where this is what's being said in this conversation to believers and non-believers. It's a package deal. Savior and Lord. Follow Jesus is to confess him to a dying world, and not just with words, but with your life. How much of your time, talent, and treasure is going to bringing somebody else into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ? And if the answer is zero, fall on your knees. Pick up the phone and call me, and let's talk about authentic discipleship. Amen? Amen. Please bow your head and pray after me. Jesus, you and your mission of seeking and saving the lost is my number one priority. My needs and desires are important, but I am second. Bless me as I become a blessing to others especially your children who are far away from you. Help me bring them home. Amen. Would you plan and, or plan, would you please stand and sing our closing song? I have decided to follow Jesus. I don't think it's in the book. It's one that didn't make the cut.
we have missed our practice just before this service <laughs> because of the videos we're showing. Uh, but you are so gracious and kind. Thank you. <laughs> Would you bow your head? Father God, we thank you for this time we've had together to open your word and share it. We thank you for new friends who've joined us online and in this room. We ask that you bless them in a very special way. And for those who have chosen to come back, those who have chosen to continue to worship here at Roseland Church, we ask you to bless them in a special way, that they would be encouraged in ways that they can face this world this week in your strength, not just theirs alone. Be with us now as we go our separate ways, as we follow your son, the Christ, as best we can. And all God's kids said, amen. amen. Have a beautiful day. Grief share at 4 o'clock.